so in this section, we're going to be covering a few things. First and foremost, in memory versus on disk. What is that all about? In this, in this code block here, you can see I am defining just a pretty simple data frame. We have three columns. We have three rows. There is an index because we can't forget about it. And I'm writing it to an SQL database. Now, this data exists in two places. One place is in my computer's virtual memory, or my RAM, and the other is on disk as an SQL database, or SQL table, I should say. What's the difference between these two? Well, virtual memory has very fast access, whereas our on disk storage, you have to open that file buffer if it's not already open, and you have to scan seek through it in order to access it. This is what SQL does every single time that you write a query. And the very important part is that SQL has had decades on decades of optimizations to make sure that every, it reduces the number of times it has to go to disk. And we'll be highlighting that through a few examples. But before we get into the SQL side of things, how does Pandas organize its data? Well, we can actually read in that data we just wrote to the, SQL, to the Postgres SQL database, and we can pull that back out. And what you see here on the top part of my printout is the data frame that we threw in there. And in the middle, we see this odd thing, this block manager. What's that all about? And underneath it, the number of blocks. Oh, man. This is getting just a little bit under the hood of pandas. How does it organize all the data that it holds onto? Well, it does this fairly intelligently, in my opinion. What we have are... We have the items, which are each column, right? So that's our column index. We have access one, which is our row index in this case. And then we have a numeric block and an object block. Now, this is fascinating because pandas will automatically sort your data by its data types and store it. And so this way, you have all of your int64 uh, data types all in one place and one nice numpy ND array. And then you have all of your objects uh, backed um, series in another ND array, and so it keeps things nice and tidy. But there's one thing that we know about NumPy ND arrays. It's that appending to a matrix or an existing array is extremely, extremely slow. So how does Pandas overcome this, right? Because one of the most common computations or common operations we do in Pandas is adding a new column. So if we uncomment this line here and give it another run, let's see how our block manager changes. Well, this is really interesting. This is a float64 data type, so we wouldn't expect it to go into the int64, but what it's done is created a new block. And by creating a new block, right, you can almost think of the block manager as like a list type. The appensions to the block manager are relatively cheap. And so, if we uncomment this next line to add in another in64, it begs the question, will this be automatically added into the existing in64 block, or are we going to create a new block? And when we run this, equal series, ah, my apologies. And when we run this and create a new column called S, we see that we have a new block. Why didn't it get added into the existing block? Well, it has to go back to that reason that I mentioned earlier. Appending to an existing array, a contiguous block of memory, is expensive. And it is, it's only expensive because in order to add something to a new array, we first have to allocate space for the new array. We have to copy the old data. We add in the new data, and it gets exhausting. And so what Pandas does under the hood seamlessly for us, it says, OK, well, why would I append to the existing array, right? the existing block, when I can just make a new block? That's like appending to a list. It's so easy. It's so fast. But what happens now when we have we're appending multiple columns, right? Here I'm going to append columns 0 through 9. They're all going to be in 64 data types. 
Oh man, our blocks are blowing up. I could increase this to 100, we would end up with 100 blocks. And you can see all of the N64 blocks that I'm making here. When does pandas know to append into an existing block versus create a new one? Well, like I said before, it intelligently does this. And what you can see as I uncomment this just simple operation, all I'm doing is accessing the first row across all of the columns. Dot lock, by default, should not copy data if we give it a simple index. And what you can see here is just, I didn't modify the data, I didn't reassign to the data frame, all I did was just call dot lock, right? Give me the first row. And what happened to my block manager? It consolidated everything. Pandas said, wow, he's trying to access the first row of all of the columns. Is it worth my time to try and go through those 12 block managers and extract the first value from each, or am I gonna combine all of my like things very quickly with a copy and then return that slice? It's much easier to deal with two blocks, right, when slicing across them, than it is to deal with 12 or 100. And so what you can see here is that Panda is a very flexible container that's column-oriented, column-typed with a meaningful index. So this is all of the mechanics that Pandas does behind the scene to keep it operating relatively quickly. But all this copying of data makes it quite memory intensive, right? I'm not even expecting to copy with a dot lock. What happens to all of my data? Well, you can see if you've ever dealt with pandas in large amounts of data, you know that if you have like eight gigabytes of RAM and your data sets like five gigabytes, you might be able to load in memory like probably, but your computations might suffer a little bit. Pandas is a memory hog and that's because it abides by copy first mentality. And this is to make sure that no data is unexpectedly mutated. But there is an alternative, right? Why do we need to keep stuff in memory? What if we just kept it on disk and whenever we wanted to access it, we just asked the disk to drum it up for us? This is exactly what the MMAP does from NumPy. And so what you can see here is I'm generating an array just of the first, you know, 0 to 9,999. I'm going to save that into a file, and I'm going to read it back out. But this operation actually isn't reading anything. It's saying, all right, you told me an array is there. Anytime you want me to access that array, I'm going to go read that file. I'm going to go do whatever you need me to do with it. And if you've set some flags, I might write back to that file, or I might make a copy somewhere else. And that's all the idea of MMAP does is. But what's the price, right? We can't just have a free lunch, right? We can't just say, oh, our data is just going to be on disk, and now I don't need to worry. I could have two gigabytes of RAM, and I can do anything. That is absolutely not true. If you can see here, I've brought in my timing context manager. I'm going to do the exact same thing, except I'm going to do, perform just a basic slicing operation. And in my first one, you can see that I have timed the MMAP slice, and I have timed the in-memory slice, or indexing. And you can see that the MMAP is much slower. This is because the cost of going back to the disk, the cost of opening that file descriptor, of skipping through it and finding, and this is just a simple, a simple uh, indexing, right? We're not even deal talking fancy indexing. The price has to be paid. So these MMAP files are not a free ticket to just having infinitely large data sets. This begs another question. How does the MMAP even work? Why can't I, can I MMAP a pandas data frame? No, 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 I don't think you can because the MMAP array assumes a static data type. So you can only store a single type of array in one MMAP file. Now, could you have a pandas data frame whose blocks are backed by MMAP files? Yeah, probably, but 
at what gain, right? You're slowing down your computations, and then, oh my goodness, if we have to do that consolidation, if we have 100 blocks, right? Now that's 100 separate files we have to work with. You want me to get the first row now? I have to open up and skip through 100 different files in order to just slice one row. Horribly inefficient, and that's why Pandas doesn't support MMAP natively. And for things like NumPy arrays, which are all single types, right? Your two, three, four, five n-dimensional arrays are all singly typed. But how can I do an out-of-memory computation in pandas? Well, you could just use Dask, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to see how we can chunk things in pandas. And pandas offers a very, very helpful chunk size parameter in almost all of its read operations. So you can see here I'm pulling in the read SQL table and I'm presenting it with a chunk size of two. In SQL, this translates to the paginates or um, limit with a skip. And so you can see it's the same idea. We're just kind of passing those mechanics actually down into SQL and pulling them back out. But this is how you can do perform some type of out of memory computation with a pandas data frame or with data stored on disk and using the data frame as a medium. And so all I'm doing is I'm iterating through this table. You can see each chunk, I'm pulling out two rows at a time. There's only three rows. So you can see that I pull the first two on the first iteration and the last row on the second iteration here. I can perform then an aggregation and I can then append that aggregation out to a list and then put it back into a data frame and do whatever I want with it. And the reason this works is because by performing that aggregation, we're shrinking the size of our data, and the goal is to get it into something that'll fit in your computer's virtual memory. This is very similar to how SQL works. When you do a group by, it's going through the disk, it's pushing down all of its computations, trying to hit its own database as little as possible, and so you're really used, relying on that query to reduce the volume of data that you're pulling out. So hopefully it's something that your computer can manage. Which brings me to the biggest difference, in my opinion, between SQL and Pandas. Pandas, as I stated earlier, is columnar oriented. That means each column has its own data type. All of the operations by default apply along the columns, and SQL is row-oriented. As we have stated, the SQL database is kind of like a bag of tuples, where each tuple represents a row. So if you want to perform an operation across these rows, it gets a little expensive. But what it makes nice and cheap is selecting things like filtering performing a where clause, right? If we're going to, if we have a system that's completely optimized to search by rows, having that where clause to hit every single row, fantastic. Ironically, in SQL, when we pull a column, not as efficient as performing a where filter, right? We're filtering rows versus filtering columns. Where, pandas is very efficient in pulling columns. When you want to pull rows, it drops down to the NumPy kind of mechanics, does a little vectorization, and it kind of offputs some of that computation into that free lunch of virtual memory, not free lunch. But to highlight this, I have two, ta uh, two tabular formats here. One is a CSV file, comma separated values, and the other is a parquet, which is a little bit more modern file format. The huge difference between these two file formats is one is row oriented, right, as highlighted by our CSV file, and the other is column-oriented. Pretty much a bunch of researchers said, hey, when we're querying tables, we're more likely to just pull out columns than we are to perform row-wise operations. So why are we storing our data in rows? We should be storing it in columns instead. And so this highlights kind of the same um, elegance that the difference between pandas and SQL has. SQL, more row-oriented, pandas, more column oriented. And that takes us to the end of our first question, exploring just some of the differences between pandas and SQL and highlighting why might we want to use one versus the other.